And joining me, my colleague, Council Member Joe Buschiano. Okay. Uh, we are awaiting the arrival of another Council Member, uh, Council Member Engler, the Chair of the Committee, is unable to be here this morning. On uh, items that we have on the schedule, items that will be approved on consent, number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number nine, number 12, number 13, and number 14. If you're here on any of those items, one, two, three, four, five, nine, 12, 13, 14, those items are gonna be approved on consent with my colleagues approval. No. This resigned, good morning, John White, City Clerk. Items two, three, and four have CAO reports that were submitted after the release of the agenda. Do you wish to approve those reports with your action today? Yes. Thank you. So if you're here on those items, those have been approved, thank you. We'll now go to, um, and I think we're awaiting the uh, arrival of Mr. Kikorian, who's not here. We want to hold on that. Uh, we want to continue item number 10. Number 10, we will continue. So we have six, seven, eight, and 11. Let's hear uh, number 11. Folks that are here on number 11. Number 11. Personal Department report relative to activities undertaken with LAPD regarding the recruitment and selection of qualified police officer candidates during the period January through June 2012. Morning. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, John Dunlop with the Personnel Department. Uh, Captain Romero, I'm the uh, Commanding Officer of Recruitment and Employment Division. So in this report reflects that we've, the um, personnel department and the Los Angeles Police Department have continued our cooperative efforts and uh, met goals and been able to, to hire. So where are we with our hiring process, number wise? Uh, we, do we meet, do we reach 10,000? Uh, yes, we have. Okay. The <laughs> What's the actual 10,001 10, or 10,000 period? And it's 1010. Uh, 10. We, uh, we are sworn. 1010? 10, 10, 10? uh, yes, our sworn strength uh, without uh, the addition of uh, G uh, the General Services uh, Department has continued to be at 9963, and we continue to hire to attrition. Uh, <clears throat> currently, um, the hiring plan calls for 363 hires for the fiscal year. Uh, which does not include the, uh, the, the addition of the uh, GSD folks. Uh, just to give you kind of a perspective, uh, uh, for December of 2012, uh, we hired uh, 50 recruits into the academy. How many uh, December, so they will graduate in six months? Correct, so they would be graduating in uh, June. And uh, because of uh, just the, our regular attrition that we have through regular retirements, pension retirements, and also through the uh, drop program, uh, we follow those numbers very closely in order to be able to uh, project uh, how many classes we're going to have during the course of the year, staying with uh, as close as we can to the 363 uh, uh, hires that we projected. Uh, it varies a little bit because there's some, uh, it depends on folks' decisions. There are some folks who are uh, slated for the uh, drop program, the, the, to retire off the drop program. Uh, you, you, course, mentioned dro you mentioned drop. How many are in drop? Uh, currently, um, we have, as of uh, DP1 uh, for 2013, uh, we had uh, four uh, who left uh, in January, four who are slated to leave in February, and we have a huge number of them leaving uh, next. So that, that's what I'm looking at, the numbers. Do we have a, a number that are in drop? Because then we can anticipate, and after that five-year term, they will be gone, and what gap we'll have. Right. We have, you know, I, let me get that back to you, because okay. the report that I have uh, indicates the number of people who are slated for drop over the course of, uh, of uh, this particular year, not the total number of people who are actually in drop uh, from its inception. Because uh, there'll be a, what we want to do is maintain the correct. department strength, and you don't want to have a void where you have one year a uh, large number that leave because of drop, and then we have a huge gap, and then we have to play catch up instead of having it done in a, a routine fashion. Oh, and you're absolutely correct, because what we do is we follow the, uh, the drop matrix. We follow that every single month. Uh, as an example, uh, 
you know, we have uh, in uh, January uh, of 2012, we had uh, we had five people uh, who were uh, were ready for for the drop to leave and drop, and we go through all the way through the entire fiscal year, all the way to June. We've identified how many people, and if we look from June 2012 through June 2013, we have a total of 85 people who are slated for the drop during that year. And so we're able to project, uh, based on those numbers, how many people we're going to have to, or how many positions we're going to have to uh, hire for the academy in order to facilitate and not have happen what you just described right, being, right. Uh, behind the eight ball. So all these numbers are, are already projected because we know exactly when those drop dates are going to occur. Exactly. However, sometimes we'll have someone who is, uh, who is, uh, per, uh, is, for example, slated for March of 2013 to drop, but they make a decision to leave earlier. Right. So then we make adjustments for that particular uh, uh, authority, and then we go ahead and hire the academy class. Uh, they, they, we, we currently have a class that's uh, scheduled to start the academy this coming Monday. How many? Forty. Okay. And we, we average somewhere between 40 and 50 recruits per class, and we're doing about every other month, depending on the, uh, on the attrition numbers. And then how many of those will normally graduate out of the 40 or 50? Uh, most of them. We have uh, uh, this last class, uh, we had uh, 50 recruits who went to the academy uh, who are graduating actually today. And uh, we'll average about 47, so we'll lose two or three per class. Okay. So the screening process obviously, is, obviously has changed and the uh, ability to withstand that academy uh, environment. Right. You know, one of the things that we do, uh, Councilman, is um, uh, in order to, for us to facilitate getting these young men and women ready, uh, we have what's called the uh, CAPS program, uh, the, the, the Candidate Assistance Program. And it's, uh, it's, it's a program that is free for them to attend. And we have those at different locations with my staff. And we prepare them not just uh, mentally, but we also prepare them physically for the rigors of the academy. And uh, when I do my seminar presentations uh, at once every other month at the ARTC for folks who are uh, going to be applying for the LAPD, that is one of the areas that I hit very hard because uh, the, the being mentally and physically prepared for the academy is very critical for you to be able to uh, successfully complete the six months. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Chair, thanks. Um, so the, the credible threat that we talk about if Prop A fails, uh, what's the uh, maybe more of a personnel question? Right of cutting 500 police officers if, uh, if the voters in the city fail to uh, pass this measure. What's the, what's the game plan? What's the strategy on this? And I know that when we start cutting police officers, in this case, uh, minimum 500, what's the catch-up plan on that? Well, it, it all depends on, on the hiring plan for a police department. So if 500 are cut, then, you know, we, we continue to process because it's, it's – uh, uh, lengthy process for police officers to go through. Right. It just would be that um, we the numbers that we produce would would be uh, reduced. I think we we have other um, um, functions that we perform in public safety promotional exams. We're doing backgrounds for other uh, public safety jobs. So we we continue to be very busy, but um, certainly we we could scale back on the on our uh, processing. However, like I said, it's a very lengthy process. It's a non-linear process. And a lot of it is reliant upon the, the candidates and, and how you know, quickly they want to, to take additional tests. So um, we would just continue to plug away. Okay. Anything else? Nope. Okay. Kevin, anything else? Uh, just uh, I want to remind everybody, if you have any sons, daughters uh, who are interested in applying for the LEPD Academy, we're still hiring. <laughs> yes, yeah, some of us have relatives in the department. <laughs> yes. All right, thank, thank you. you. So we'll approve that. Okay. Without objection. All right. Without objection, that is approved. Thank you very much. That was number 11. Do we know uh, arrival time of Mr. Kikorian? I'd like to hold that item for his five minutes. All right. So let's go to um, number six. Item six, motion Biscayano Englander instructing LAPD to report relative to the use of social media to enable senior lead officers to communicate with residents and participate in online neighborhood watch groups. Take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for being here. You know, I introduced this motion uh, to get a sense of where the department was heading in terms of taking advantage of the role of social media. Uh, in the 21st century of community policing. And in an ideal war world, as we often say, and I, I often said, even as a senior lead officer, we'd love to have 
a police officer in every street corner in the city of Los Angeles, but with tough fiscal times, it's impossible. So we need to really think outside the box, as we often say, and, and um, using our community policing strategies in a way that we can, you know, tap into Facebook, Twitter, and, uh, and, and others to uh, improve the quality of life in the city. Um, in one part of my district, we, we launched a, a Facebook neighborhood watch program, and uh, within a matter of a couple days, we had in the coastal San Pedro region 300 uh, people following this neighbor, cyber neighborhood watch group. Um, so it's definitely a great opportunity to have uh, this this approach in in our community policing strategies, but also it's important that I found uh, in, in my talking to my former colleagues out at the harbor that they did not have access to a Facebook account. And I, I think in just such a short time with the successes we've had in, in the harbor area, I know we can have it citywide, but we want to uh, give uh, an added tool to our, our senior lead officers um, in continuing their efforts to improve the quality of life uh, to, and also in the importance of empowering uh, our neighborhoods and the senior lead officers to have more information at their disposal to, to do their job. So my question can you just give us a sense of what the department stand, where the department stands in terms of allowing officers and giving them access, uh, uh, you know, uh, access not access of, of uh, social media access, uh, and where we stand on that, and uh, give give us a brief idea of what the training consists of, consists of, consists of, and how we can expect officers to engage uh, with the public via Facebook and other social media channels. Absolutely. Um, by the way, I'm Commander Matt Blake. I work for the Office of Operations. Thank you. Uh, which has all the areas that are uh, that really that that really go to all the council districts. Uh, the the I've brought with me really our two experts in social media, uh, Captain John Romero, who works for Racer Division, um, and also Chris Baus, who is the foremost expert in this organization regarding and is a post qualified trainer in the area of social media. Um, we, we also, two years ago, um, actually we were put on, a, on this campaign. Uh, two years ago we decided, and, and admittedly even that's a little bit late, you know, we're, we're catching up to where the communities are. We started to realize that our communities weren't just um, in our neighborhoods, but they're actually chatting and they're, they're having conversations and blogging and, and twit, or Twitter, tweeting. Right. Um, I'll, <laughs> twit. <laughs> so, yeah tweeting one another and so it, it became very obvious to us um, and primarily with all the flash mobbing that was going on for us that we needed to get ahead of this. We needed to be involved in the, the operational readiness, uh, we needed to have a, an investigative component and we needed to have a community component. Right. So two years ago actually the three of us sat in a room and we just began going over what we needed to do to set this up. I will tell you that particularly I just want to address the one issue with regard to um, har the harbor. <clears throat> uh, all senior leads have access, every single one of them. Uh, whether they choose to do that or not, that's uh, obviously that's something between their captain and, and, and their community. Uh, but every one of them does have access. Uh, it's, they have to apply or do they need uh, a 15-2? There's, there's, they need a, there's send. a 15 seven that's 15 requested seven. from their boss and their boss signs it and it's, it's like that. As a matter of fact, I think we've even made it easier than that, have we not, where all senior leads have access to that. Um, but it is simple. Um, and, and I believe all know, I know Harbor's far away from downtown, but we, you know, we do get that message across. And, mm -hmm. and yesterday was a, uh, we, we had um, Comstat, and I actually Comstat at uh, Harbor, and they were actually bragging quite a bit about their social media program Good. and their, their, uh, their neighborhood watch programs that they've got in some of their areas. So mm -hmm. I do, I, I, wanna, I wanna turn it over to these guys here because I think they're gonna give you a, a very good brief as to where the department is and, and we're very proud of where we are and we know we've got a long way to go uh, just because this continues to evolve right. so fast. And, uh, but we do have a couple of the best here so I wanna, I wanna let you, them talk. Thank you, thank you. Sir, so in, in 2009, I was the public information officer for, uh, for Chief Bratton, and he was really unafraid of, of social media. With all, all the risks that go with it, he still wanted us to use it. And so we worked hard at not tying the officer's hands, and we actually unwrote the, the uh, policies that were being drafted to, to restrict it and, and uh, create a, a single point where people could uh, have outbound communication. We wanted everyone to be able to do it, which is consistent with our our media relations guide that says that anybody who has is qualified to speak can speak and so we started with the, the uh, 
with a version of, of Twitter known as, as Nixle in 2009. I remember that. And Nixle now allows with a single keystroke to publish to Facebook and to Twitter and whatever the next big thing is. We know that the next big thing could capture the world in a matter, in a matter of days. And so as, a, as of today, there are 4,000 people uh, subscribing to uh, Nixel in the Harbor area alone. And that was a single incident that, that uh, really tipped the balance on that, where there was a believed to be an explosion near the, uh, in, a, in a hotel in 2009. And we put, I stood in front of the media cameras and told them, text your zip code to phone number 888-777. You're automatically in this system. And you can go shopping, you can do whatever you want, and when the cruise lines are ready to take you back, we'll, we'll broadcast that. And we did that. Mm -hmm. And so we proved that this device is what, as you said, is the, the future of communication in the, uh, in the United States, in the world. In 2009, 70% of, uh, of the United States had both in their houses, a wired phone and a cell phone. And the, uh, the number of people with cell phones only uh, was about half of the remaining, and the number of people with wired phones only was, was the other half. Now that is, has shifted, and this is going to be, uh, people are abandoning their wired phone for, uh, for this phone. And we know that people in the community, they, they will abandon their, uh, they will place their children, they will abandon or place their pets, they will lose their house, lose their car before they lose this device. And so this is really the future for emergency communication, outbound and and inbound for the uh, for the police department, and we've we've recognized it. So, the, as a as a matter of policy, to your question, we are encouraging people. There is no policy restricting it, and we are encouraging people. Every area has been trained on this. Some people, and while we don't tell them they have to do it. The, uh, there's people like Northeast and Olympic that have their own TV station and they don't rely on the media to show up to their news conferences. They can publish their own, mm -hmm. uh, they can publish their own crime alerts and, and have their own uh, news. And, and it's, it really is working. We've had some success in the, in the area of, of criminal investigation protecting uh, the public uh, through the use of social media. And I can ask Chris just to uh, speak briefly on, on uh, some success stories that we've had. So, I'm sorry, Chris, before you, you chime in. Cap, so for every area, is it a, a you shall or you, is it a directive or an option to have a Facebook? Well, it's, it's not a shall. Okay. Um, however, as you know, um, the way we handle Comstad and, and that um, it's a, it is a Comstad issue. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, one of the things that, they, that the captains love to do is to brag about how many followers they have right, and, right, and their right, Facebook right. page. And, right. you know, and uh, one of our, they've got license plate frames on the back of police cars that give their, you know, their, their address. So uh, every single division, uh, not only when we talk about crime reduction, you know, we, we talk about the strategies, police officers, cops on dots, all of that kind of stuff. Right. But the other piece is, what is our community doing? We know that we've got 10,000 officers and we have this huge but massive of real estate right. and we can't do it alone. And so uh, the push toward community really opened up wide when it came to social media. And we are, we're hitting, we're hitting on all cylinders. We just keep uh, moving forward. And I, and I, I do, I think... Chris, I, please. Yeah, please. <laughs> now the man who really does the work. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> we know how that goes. From the stars to the bars to the stripes. <laughs> He is the expert. <laughs> um, the department has really realized that over 78% of the United States is using mobile devices and on the internet now. And even 78% of those people are on Facebook specifically. When we look at the internet um, from 2000 to 2012, internet growth has, has skyrocketed at least 153%. So the department is really making a lot of moves to incorporate social media in what we do. One of the things the CSU has done is we put two experts in each bureau to help each division underneath them. And that's a mandate. Mm. And I can guarantee you that each one of those divisions does have a Twitter account and does have a Facebook account as well as the bureaus, as well as the department as a whole. Um, for example, our North Hollywood account has over 13,000 followers on it. And we are trying to use those accounts to uh, communicate with the community as much as possible. Um, just to touch real quick on the training aspect, I myself am a post-certified advanced instructor and I'm currently in the master instructor's course and we are working, the department as a whole, to create a universal training for all of our detectives and mm -hmm. our field officers. Um, as far as the investigative support function goes, we have had uh, great success with being able to 
utilize uh, all sorts of different social media and internet avenues just to assist our investigations, helping uh, detectives move through the paperwork, helping them streamline the process. We're clearing cases faster. We're doing a much better job at incorporating everything that the internet has to offer. One of the examples I'd like to share with you um, is a case that we had about a year ago. We had a young lady who used Facebook a lot, or MySpace a lot and she met a gentleman online and she was abducted. Um, and we had a, a good, a good three-day search going on and some of the evidence uh, from MySpace became available and we were able to use that evidence to narrow them down to a single location and within an hour and a half not only did we have both suspects in custody but we also had our victim in custody. Wow. Oh, recovered, sorry. Recovered, right. So it just, it, it's been really amazing what this allows us to do and uh, I can guarantee you that the department is, is moving forward leaps and bounds to incorporate this into our daily activities. So Chris is one of uh, two people at the office level, and we also have two people in every bureau, as, he's, as he said, so ten people total during the day. And uh, Racer covers the nights and the weekends for the, uh, for the social um, media component. I, just, I want to, uh, Mr. Chair, I just want to thank uh, each and every one of you in the police department for embracing uh, this model. And it's evident that uh, a lot of work um, has been put into this uh, effort. And I know we, um, we, we, as a police department in the second largest city in the country, um, will serve as a model for other uh, smaller agencies as well. So uh, thank you uh, for the report, and I'll just turn it back to Mr. Chair. Mr. Corrin has joined us. Great. All right, so uh, with that, anything else? No, sir. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Good Last thank time you. I saw you had the bars, now you got stars, so you're moving up. <laughs> Very good. So we will approve that. Thank you. Number six. Thank you very much. Congratulations and good work. Let's go to number seven. Item seven, motion Bruce Gaino Garcetti requesting that LAPD and the city attorney report relative to the policies and procedures currently in place to investigate instances of cyberbullying, additional resources or ordinances needed to more effectively address this problem and related legal matters. Thanks, John. I, if I may, Mr. Chair. Take it away. This, um, this motion um, was triggered by uh, a number of calls that I received in my office, office from a number of concerned parents in San Pedro and Wilmington about uh, several Facebook groups that were posting photos of young women and asking uh, members of the group to discuss their level of, of um, sexual uh, promiscuity based on the photos and it was pretty disgusting to to see that unfold and the parents said that they approached the schools and attempted to contact Facebook but were stymied by lack of response by Facebook and uh, the lack of speed anyone seemed to be moving on to take take down these groups and um, once they shared this information with my office we were able to use our contacts and Lieutenant Grossman who's here on the, um, and the great work you're doing. It was great as a former colleague to, to know that I had your cell phone and, and your efforts really helped shut down these, these, uh, these groups. Um, and and we, we got this, these, two, these groups on the Facebook's radar and they were able to take it down within hours. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. As we, as we know, bullying has been occurring in schools for longer than most of us have been around. But however, social media in itself and its channels now allow bullies to inflict damage to a larger audience much faster than they can sometimes get caught. And the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development reports that some 20% of teenagers are reporting incidents of cyberbullying which can include posting of harmful photos, which we saw in my area, uh, spreading rumors via text messages and being directly contacted and threatened. And uh, as a senior lead officer, I, I had unfortunately had an opportunity to mentor a couple teenagers who were victims of cyberbullying. So this, this issue is near and dear to my heart. And as, as we see across the country, oftentimes, cyberbullying uh, tends to lead to suicides. And as we know, uh, bullying can have harmful and lasting impacts and sometimes can lead to fatal results, uh, which um, this is why I, I've cra crafted this motion as I indicated. So tell us what, um, or can you just walk us through the current steps um, that are, are what, the current steps that are taken once there's a sus suspected incident of cyberbullying 
and two, uh, how are these incidents usually reported and investigated? Uh, Captain Zaraga from uh, Commanding Officer of Juvenile Division, sir. Uh, basically right now what we've done is uh, our best resource for these types of um, uh, cases have been working with the schools, getting the parents involved, uh, bringing all the parties involved in and saying, this is what's going on, this, this is what your kids are doing, uh, and this is the effect that it's, that it's having. Uh, whether intentional or unintentional, this is the effect and it's creating uh, other kids to feel um, you know, discouraged, uh, despondent, uh, mm -hmm. and leading to, you know, we highlight the tragedies that have occurred across the country as far as uh, some of these kids being bullied or, or focused on to the point where they feel there's nowhere, nowhere to go except to take their own lives. Um, the motion called for us to review what we currently have in place. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we have to report that there's really nothing on the books, uh, statute either uh, in the municipalities or in the state that would cover cyberbullying. Uh, and if you, you know, went across this room, uh, much less the, the country or the state, you would find varying definitions of what cyberbullying is uh, or isn't. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the, the First Amendment issue. Uh, which uh, it makes it difficult and hard to really uh, put something that fits in there. Uh, when we have a specific instance or a specific uh, threat to an individual, uh, certainly there's statutes that cover that. Uh, when we have uh, instances where, uh, you know, instances of pornographic uh, photos being posted or, or distributed uh, or disseminated. Uh, there's statutes that, that cover that. Uh, but as far as the resources, we have statutes available to us. Um, and Lieutenant Grossman, who heads the Internet Crimes Against Children Unit, can, can, can best tell you, there's really nothing that really fits in that we can say, yeah, you're, you're bullying this person. You're using, uh, whether it's social media, uh, as, as, you know, sexting on the telephone, uh, or whatever, uh, you, you're going to be covered under the statute. Um, but we also recognize that we have to get around uh, everybody's right to free speech. Uh, uh, and where does that go over into a specific threat? I think if an ordinance, or our recommendation is if we can look at an ordinance uh, that covers when somebody is targeted specifically for ridicule, uh, a focus, uh, unwanted focus, or things or images of them uh, without their permission are being posted, then maybe that's something we can work with. And I know uh, my, my office is working with my partner in Sacramento, um, Assemblymember Isidore Hall, who's uh, definitely embraced this uh, issue as well, and will be uh, taking it on the Sacramento side of things. But that's a great recommendation of what we can do on the city side. On, in developing and, and crafting an ordinance. Some other things that we've met with the ISPs, such as Facebook, before the administrators or the creators. What's of, ISP just for the, our, our, our viewers and the listeners? Internet service providers or the internet protocol. We didn't know who the creators were, so there's no way we could do anything about it. Such as the Ratchet case, there was who made this Facebook page. Right. With speaking with Facebook and other ISPs, they've, they're now going to force the people who make those pages to say who they are. By doing that, a lot of times the people take their, their page down, or if they won't say who they are, Facebook automatically will take their page down. Additionally, we have met with them informally that if we believe that they're targeting someone individually, Facebook is working with us and other Internet Crimes Against Children task forces to remove those pages. That's how we're able to get your page down. Right. And, and we thank you for that, uh, Andrea. You were just on it. And you championed that effort that evening. I'll never forget that. But we were really able to work with Facebook, Hannah. And it's great that you have that communication, that working relationship with, with Facebook. We're also fortunate that we meet once a year with all ISPs. So if there is an issue with someone, whether it be Omega, Kix, or someone else, we have a name to a face and a person. Right. So if there's an issue anywhere in the city, we can help out because we actually know the body and have the telephone number as opposed to just a email address that you're going to get. Kind of, We can make... Uh, changes by uh, our relationships with Facebook and other ISPs. Very good. Oh, good, good morning, members of the committee. My name is Eve Sheedy. I actually am appearing for Tracy Webb in my office, and you'll be glad to know she's not here because she's training hmm. um, on this very issue. She does a tremendous amount of training around the community, particularly in schools, about to parents about how to um, 
figure out what their kids are doing on the internet and how to work with their kids. I don't want to say police because I don't think that sets up the right dynamic, but how to work together to make sure their their the children are are safe. Um, Good. My particular expertise is domestic violence, um, and I just want to say this clearly. You know, bullying is sort of step one in what becomes teen dating violence and what becomes adult domestic right. violence, as you well know. Right. Um, so there is a lot of work in my office being done on all of those fronts. We prosecute whatever we can, and due to the great work of LAPD, uh, when the cases get to us, um, we try to, you know, ensure registration and things like that and ask for relatively um, hard sentences. Part of the issue, um, as the lieutenant said, is that it's a fine line drawing these kind of statutes mm -hmm. because of the First Amendment protections and because a lot of this conduct, it's very difficult to make a lot of this conduct criminal. But so do you think crafting an ordinance will help with investigations and... In, in if we're able to craft it, it'll give us the opportunity to have a misdemeanor crime which will allow us to get to the search warrant. Currently, I don't have that. We don't. Ha you don't have that tool right now. I, I don't have that tool. So if right. we're able to craft something without violating the First Amendment, it will assist law enforcement. The challenge is, right. how do we do it so narrow that we're not we're, we're not hurting someone's First Amendment rights? So can, can I, if, if I can, Mr. Chair, just direct the city attorney to, to start crafting and working with the uh, LAPD uh, to do what it takes to. Um, make sure that they have the necessary tools to prevent uh, cyberbullying and, of course, ultimately prevent another suicide in our city. Yes, certainly. We, we have one, one that was very, very good, too. Obviously, uh, a new field that we haven't ventured into as of recent times. Uh, we have one public speaker on this, Arnold Sachs. And I, I believe before we get to our public speaker, we, we have uh, our human relations family here. Members from our Human Relations Commission, would you like to chime in, or? Um, sure. Good morning. Just please identify, identify yourself, yourself, please. Good morning. I'm Jumana Silian Saba with the City of Los Angeles Human Relations Commission. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to chime in and say a few words about this. I really just, first of all, um, I'm very happy to see the work of LAPD, obviously, and, and the work of this committee in really pushing forward policies on cyberbullying. One of the things that our office has been working on is we've convened a coalition. It's an anti-bullying coalition that is composed of government, um, actually including our LAPD, um, as well as uh, LA School Police, LAUSD. We also have several uh, community-based organizations, um, including ADL, who are also present here, really been um, at the forefront of addressing issues of bullying. Uh, we've hosted a public hearing in November, and uh, Councilmember Krikorian, you were part of that committee, and you heard firsthand uh, some of the really difficult stories that the young people came up and spoke about. Through the work of our coalition, we've really, um, the issue with bullying, as you all know, is not only on school campuses, and it really is beyond and into social media. We are currently working with Missouri State University. Uh, we are conducting a, um, an online experimental study on social media, and, and it really is more of a cause and effect of what really triggers a youth to go to certain sites, but to also create online avenues for them to engage on this issue in a more productive way. And so we're really Good. giving them an online avenue. Good. And so if there is any kind of um, policy or any kind of political support to really begin to push forward some sort of funding and support towards programming on social media, because it's one thing to have programming on campus, but through the focus groups that we've conducted with some of the young people on school campuses, most of it is doesn't only happen on the school campus. It right. really is happening in the neighborhood, right. in the community, after school, and online. And any photo these young ladies take is never sacred, as we know. And that's part of the educational component that we need to get across to our parents as well, and to our teenagers. Definitely. And, and uh, whatever 
you know, as far as the uh, Human Relations Commission and the Anti-Bullying Coalition, um, our focus and aim is to um, help with uh, pushing forward policies to address, and, and so in that aspect, we'll be more than happy to assist in any way possible. I brought some brochures. I don't have enough for everybody. I brought some brochures about Anti-Bullying Coalition um, so that you get an idea of who is on this. Um, coalition in, in where we're aiming to go with it. Well, thank you all for your leadership thank and you. guidance. And we do have sure. a number of uh, uh, that public speaker, Arnold Sachs. Thank you. Thank you. Two minutes. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Arnold morning. Sachs. Um, you're addressing cyberbullying. Um, are you addressing the violent videos that are the videos that are coming out, even becoming more violent? Uh, somebody mentioned sexting and porn. Are you addressing porn as general ability to dial up anywhere, anytime, anyhow? Um, any penalties involved, and the, and the amount of investigation, and the the young lady who spoke in the social service. The, the, the social phenomenon, these are people probably just repeating behavior that they already see. So are you addressing social phenomenon that maybe address foster children and, and the life that they may lead? And conversely, with the advent of the sports spectacular and signing day becoming an all-compassing venue for some of these national prep stars, they may not be the bulliers, but the people that hang on with them, they become bulliers because they become part of a set program that enables athletes and people that are elevated to high school age to that level of invincibility that those hangers on become bullying. And they mentioned something about filing, and you can and you can go online to for different <clears throat> um, programs. What about and unfortunately, in all too real world, the predators that go online to find these people that file for help on these programs, because that's where they get a lot of their victims. Is that something that should be addressed also? Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, we will now, without opposition, move that forward. Okay, thank you. Without, thank you. Thank uh, you. We now have uh, Mr. Kikorian is with us. We do now have a quorum uh, on that last matter, and we will now go to number eight, and that is Mr. Kikorian, your motion. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Members, 20 years ago, uh, it, it seems difficult to remember now, given the progress that we've made over those 20 years. But 20 years ago, Los Angeles had over a thousand homicides. And we've made dramatic progress in the ensuing 20 years in bringing that crime rate down. And for the 10th year in a row, we've continued to bring crime down and made Los Angeles the safest big city in America. Uh, and that's been thanks in large measure to the incredibly professional work of the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, but it's also been due to uh, activism throughout our city by communities who have said enough. We have had it with our communities being destroyed and racked by gangs and racked by uh, random violence. And many of the people that we're going to be hearing from today uh, in a moment are people who have been personally impacted by gun violence and people who uh, initiated their activism because of that personal impact and have said enough is enough. And yet with all the progress, and I should say too, that much of the reason that we're a safer city now is because of uh, the work that this council has done in leading America in enacting reasonable restrictions on the ready availability of firearms, which so often aggravate a violent situation into a deadly situation. And uh, former council member Mike Feuer is here, who was the author of many of those uh, groundbreaking efforts which have gone on to set the example for the state of California and the rest of the country in, uh, in terms of uh, reasonable restrictions on, on firearms. And yet at the same time, we know 
that our constituents continue to have nagging fears uh, about gun violence, despite the drop in crime. Uh, and those nagging fears are very reasonable because they've seen in my neighborhood the North Hollywood shootout uh, of 1997 in which the Los Angeles Police Department was outgunned mm -hmm. by two uh, gun-toting criminals wearing body armor who were able to keep the entire department at bay uh, because, they, because of the degree to which they were armed. Uh, they've seen the West Valley Jewish Community Center uh, massacre that happened uh, in, in the valley. And then they've seen an ensuing stream of similar incidents, uh, the 1999 Columbine shooting, the Stockton sc schoolyard shooting, and so many other similar crimes that have taken place since. And what is common among those incidents is the degree to which a, a person with evil motivation has been able to make a crime significantly worse uh, because of the high degree of firepower that they had at their disposal. The ability to spray many bullets across uh, many victims in a very short amount of time. So, um, and most recently, of course, we've seen that dramatically illustrated with the, the tragedy that beset Newtown, uh, Connecticut as well. So today's measure is uh, really just a common sense step towards um, making, first of all, giving our police department uh, a fair opportunity to be able to respond to these sorts of uh, crimes, but also uh, making sure that when crime happens, when violence happens, uh, we minimize uh, the, the, the ramifications of it. We minimize the number of victims that will fall to that crime by restricting the number of rounds that can be fired off in a short amount of time by making these high capacity magazines that are so readily available still uh, in, in Los Angeles, banning those from our city limits. Now, the state of California has already uh, prohibited manufacturing, prohibited importation, prohibited sale of high capacity magazines. And yet the possession of those very magazines, the possession of those magazines that the state of California has declared to be a nuisance, um, is still perfectly permissible, uh, provided that they weren't uh, uh, mm. imported or sold in violation of the state law. I think it's time that we take a step to address that problem uh, by banning the possession of high capacity magazines here in the city of Los Angeles. It's important that, be re that we be respectful of people's reasonable and understandable desire to be safe in their home and in their business by protecting themselves uh, and their families. But at the same time, we have to take those common, step, common sense steps to protect the children on our playgrounds. We have to take the common sense steps that we can to protect our neighbors and our communities and our law enforcement officers on the street uh, from the kind of mass mayhem that these high capacity magazines make possible and facilitate. That's what we're here for today. Uh, and so I'm very pleased to be able to, to bring this motion before you and uh, respectfully ask for your support. Thank you, um, Mr. Clerk. To read into the record, uh, item number eight, please. Yes, sir. Item eight, motion for Toya and Buscaino, Englander, Koretz, request that the city attorney, the CLA, and LAPD report relative to the feasibility, effectiveness, and benefits of an ordinance prohibiting the possession of high-capacity ammunition magazines within the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Um, you have questions, or should we go to the... I just have a comment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Krikorian, for putting this forward. I I'll never forget sitting in the police academy in 1997 and hearing the uh, radio broadcast of the North Hollywood shooting, and I was thinking, what the hell did I get myself into? But at the same time, it motivated me to get out. And uh, in the years of within the LAPD, um, I'll never forget the homicide scenes of victims, young and old, uh, of the high capacity uh, firearms that were being used in the city. And had, you know, if we had something like this in place as a tool the police department can have to uh, bring forth and have, find any way to prevent these homicides from occurring, it's something that we need to look, f look at and move forward on. So I, I thank you and I, I'm proud to second this motion with you, Mr. Krikorian, and 
God help us if you know we we have another uh, homicide in the city of Los Angeles in involving these high-powered weapons. Thank you. And I, uh, I too, at the time, was with the Los Angeles Police Department and went to that North Hollywood Bank shootout. So it was a, a situation that was very, very frightening. And as you mentioned, it, it brings back those, uh, those sad memories. Uh, so we have a number of public speakers, and we will call you forward, and we will uh, hear from you. You each have two minutes to speak. Uh, first will be Mike Fear, followed by, there's a number of ladies here, Women's Against Gun Violence. Uh, and we can take you up with a group and then in the order that you wish to speak. So, Mike Fear. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, I am here in strong support of the leadership that the council member, Mr. Kikorian, has shown by this legislation. I'm very pleased that, uh, to, that uh, Mr. Buscaino has seconded this along with the support from the acting chair and the chair of this committee. It suggests that there's going to be a broad consensus on the city council to support Mr. Krikorian's efforts in this regard. Uh, I'm here because in 1997, I was the author of the city's legislation to ban the sale or transfer of high capacity magazines. Uh, nearly was about 16 years ago or so. Uh, that ban had a catalytic effect, as Mr. Krikorian has pointed out, so often here in Los Angeles, we've written legislation that has subsequently become the law of the state, and in many cases, been a message that other states have followed, and indeed sometimes the federal government has followed as well. This is one example of such legislation. We ban the sale or transfer of high capacity magazines, but this is a next logical step in the evolution of our gun violence legislation here in the city of Los Angeles. And I, I came here today as the author of many of Los Angeles's laws on gun violence, as Mr. Kikorian has mentioned, to say that I completely agree with the comment that in every neighborhood of our city, as I've been traveling throughout the city recently, I hear the same comment that the city needs to be taking every step we can, every reasonable step we can, with regard to gun violence to stem the tide of gun violence. And there's no civilian who needs a high capacity magazine. I need to say that again. There is no civilian who needs a high capacity magazine for any purpose. This legislation will assure that we not only ban the sale or transfer of high capacity magazines, but if in, for other ways, uh, if in other ways a civilian has gotten a hold of such a, a magazine, that that magazine is unlawful and that our law enforcement officials can take appropriate steps to get those out of the hands of those who ought not need them and in fact who pose a danger to those in their communities. Let's continue the leadership that we've begun many years ago. Thank you very much, Mr. Krikorian, for this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fuhrer. Uh, Women Against One Violence, there's a number of you that are here. If you'll please come forward. We've got four chairs. Uh, Joshua Stepakov, uh, Rhonda Foster, Lori uh, Stefanian, Margot Bennett, and let's see, that... However you want to sit, it's okay with us. <laughs> and I think there's a couple more. So just uh, whoever you want to start, because I know you had a uh, speaking order. All right. Um, I'll start first. My name is Joshua Stepakoff. In August of 1999, I was the survivor of a hate crime at the North Valley Jewish Community Center shooting. I was shot twice by the neo-Nazi Buford Furrow, um, who uh, came in with a Norinco Uzi knockoff and fired 70 rounds in less than a minute. He shot three kids under the age of six, myself included, and um, shot a teenager and the receptionist. Uh, and it was very clear that if he didn't have a high capacity magazine, he would not have been able to rattle off so many shots in such a short amount of time and therefore would have possibly led to uh, um, a fewer amount of, of people being hit. And uh, I want to thank you for making this motion. It's extremely bold, and it's a, a difficult topic that people don't want to talk about, and I'm glad that we're here having this discussion. Um, you know, I was the same age as the kids at Sandy Hook, and I was one of the lucky ones who survived, and so I'm here to, to share my story and hope that we can do something so that other kids at the same age don't have to go through what I went through and they can continue to leave, lead a happy life with their families and you know, grow up to do great things. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Rhonda Foster, and I'm here representing my family, my children. Um, December of 1997, uh, I had taken my son, uh, Evan, my old, seven years old at the time, and Alec, who was 10 months, to the park to pick up his soccer trophy and to sign up for the Winter Basketball League. And uh, some young men came to the park and uh, possessed a Mac 90 assault weapon and um, shot 75 rounds, 14 of which hit my vehicle, uh, killing Evan and uh, injuring Alec. He sustained bullet fragment wounds to his left eye. And uh, uh, thankfully, he, he survived and uh, is now just turned 16. Um, I was utterly shocked to learn that this kind of a weapon was available and that many rounds could be shot. And so I take every opportunity and I thank you, Mr. Kikorian, for um, bringing this forward because whatever we can do, you know, it makes a difference. I wanted to share with you a poem that Evan wrote and we found after he was killed. He said, I know a place. I know a place where things will grow, see, hear, walk, and talk. I know a place where things will eat, sing, play, smell, think, and read. The place is surfing in the USA home. That was his reality. And um, that's what we have to make sure is our reality for our children. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. My name's Margo Bennett, and I'm the executive director of Women Against Gun Violence. And we've been working with the city council since 1993 to make Los Angeles City the county and the state of California a safer place for the residents. Uh, we agree that private individuals have no reason to have a high capacity magazine. And those magazines can actually turn any type of weapon, including a handgun, into a mass killing machine. Uh, one of the reasons why we're very interested in supporting this ban is because it actually crosses the range between handguns and military-style weapons. Um, we're so grateful to you for bringing this forward, and thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, council members. Uh, my name is Lori Sackin. I'm president of the board of the Women Against Gun Violence. And I want to thank and you know so much uh, the members of our board who are survivors and share their stories selflessly and bravely uh, to communicate the horrific effects of, of these um, high-capacity magazines. Um, we don't need to recount the horror stories. They're all fresh in our minds and our hearts. Um, I wanted to say that these types of bans do work, and we're finding that out from recent research. Washington Post recently conducted a study, a snapshot study of Virginia, and what they found is that the 1994 assault weapons ban, um, the number of firearms equipped with high-capacity ammunition magazines began to drop several years into the ban. And at, in, in, uh, at the end of the ban, in 2004, they had reached 9%. And several years after that, they again, they more than doubled. In 2010, 20% of weapons recovered by the Virginia police uh, had re were equipped with high capacity magazines. Um, as Margot mentioned, you can turn any a type of firearm into a high, into a mass killing machine. Um, handguns. They found that uh, in uh, two, 904 in 2004, the year the ban ended, they confiscated 452 weapons. In 2009, the number had jumped to 986. So these bans work. Council Member Kikorian's motion is an opportunity for Los Angeles to lead the way again and bring a sense of security and safety to our families and our communities that we desperately need. So thank you. Thank you. And we have four more, so we can have those folks come up. Uh, Kaylee Schilling, David Derringer, Dennis Hathaway, and Arnold Sachs. The next four. And those are the only cards that we have on this matter. And we'll start with the, uh, there's one more. Arnold Somebody's not, Arnold Sachs, okay. He's in the back. Yeah. Go ahead. Ma'am. Kaylee Schilling, Schilling. let's oh. uh, start with you, ma'am. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for, for having me. My name is Kylie Schilling. I'm the director of the Violence Prevention Coalition of Los Angeles. 
and we represent over 80 member organizations across Los Angeles. These are public agencies and community-based and faith-based organizations, um, all of whom uh, believe that we can prevent violence in our communities. And uh, one of our founding issues over 20 years ago was the belief that responsible gun policies are a key strategy in violence reduction in Los Angeles. You've heard um, really powerfully this morning the human cost uh, of these, these high capacity ammunition magazines, um, but there is also the financial cost. Uh, it is estimated that across this country the economic impact of gun violence is over $100 billion annually. Um, so I would say this, this is a, a motion that works on so many levels, and so we thank you for your, your leadership and your support on this issue as, as there, is, uh, there are so many levels in which this is costing us as a community. Thank you. Mr. Derringer. Thank you. I, I'm David Derringer, attorney for Cal Guns Foundation and Cal FFL. The people have a fundamental right to keep and bear firearms for self-defense including those in common use with magazines having a capacity greater than 10 rounds. Any outright ban on the possession of magazines is a violation of the Second Amendment. If Los Angeles passes any outright ban on the possession of magazines within its jurisdiction, the Cal Guns Foundation and Cal FFL will, with taxpaying residents of LA, sue the city for civil rights violations in federal court and take the case to the U.S. Supreme Court if necessary. We will absolutely not accept LA scapegoating tens of thousands of law abiding gun owners and retailers in L.A., and countless travelers and visitors for the evil and insane acts of a, of a few criminals. Many in Helenos used high-cap mags for protection during the L.A. riots. They know gang members will get all the high-cap mags they, they need, either from across the border or directly from DOJ. And the public knows that high-cap mags favor the defender, not the attacker. The two or three seconds it takes to change mags is no big deal for an attacker. The defender, on the other hand, has to deal with reaction time and extreme stress. Handgun rounds are weak, and at least two good hits are required to stop an attacker. Assuming a 30% hit ratio, a 10-round magazine is barely adequate against a single attacker. Success against two attackers requires at least a 15-round magazine. Federal statistics show that 20% of homicides are by multiple, multiple attackers. Given 300 murders a year in LA, that would mean 60 victims of multiple attackers each year who need high capacity mags to stay alive. Recently in Georgia, a mother protecting her children fired six shots from a revolver at a home invader. He was hit five times but survived and drove away. Imagine if there was a second attacker. Mr. Krikorian, if your wife were attacked by someone with body armor, would you want her to have to run across the room to get another magazine? Of course not. This proposal is your chap a critic, and the Constitution is your reluctant passenger. Hope you can swim. Hope we all can. Put the brakes on it now. Thank you. Uh, for the record, the L.A. murder rate was less than 300. 298. Well, that's less than 300. Last year. So. Uh, Dennis Hathaway. Uh, thank you. I'm Dennis Hathaway. I'm president of the Coalition to Ban Billboard Blight. Um, a lot of the groups, community groups that form our support, are very concerned with gun violence. The reason I know that is because I regularly get calls, emails from people about billboards that depict guns and acts of violence, particularly when they're um, in the vicinity of schools, churches, other, other inappropriate places. Uh, I'm also, our group is also a member of uh, another coalition to, of community groups working to prohibit alcohol advertising on public property. And I also know that uh, these groups also deal with issues of gun violence, um, and uh, they're aware, very much aware of the nexus of gun violence with alcohol. So there are lots of people out there I know personally and that I have regular contact with who would like to see these kind of actions. It's a small thing, but I want to commend Councilman Krikorian for bringing this forward. And if one person, one life can be saved uh, through an action like this, then it's worth it. Thank you. Thank you. Arnold Sachs, our final speaker on this matter. Yes, thank you. Good, good morning again, Arnold Sachs. You know, back in the day, it used to be said that war is good for big business. Well, gun violence basically is good for uh, retirement funds. If you want to look at gun violence 
and these magazine uh, capacities. Look at the discussion that was brought up after the last um, tragedy about the relationship between retirements, CalPERS, even the, the city's retirement fund, and gun manufacturers. And, and pull your funds out, make some legislation there. Pull your funds out of the gun manufacturers who make these magazines or the subsidiaries that make these magazines for the rifles that can use the high velocity and high capacity magazines. And along that line, just to make a quick correction, although I believe the Bill of Rights and the Second Amendment allows you to carry a firearm, I don't believe there's any language in there that speaks to the size of the magazine for that firearm. So if you're suing on that premise that the Bill of Rights allows you to carry a firearm, it doesn't say a firearm with 20 shells, it just says a firearm. And if you want to control a little bit of gun violence, control the access to the magazines, and if you want to control the access to the magazines, take your steps that way, because controlling the firearms, that's just not working. But controlling the magazines and going through a process where people have to do more to get more, whether it's schooling, whether it's permitting, whether it's fingerprinting, whatever it is, it's not allowed by the Second Amendment. It's not denied by the Second Amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kikorian. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'd like to ask the representatives of the Los Angeles Police Department and uh, the city attorney uh, to come forward. And uh, I think at the outset, I should say, I have had um, some discussion with the city attorney who has indicated that uh, there's some areas of research that uh, we may want to be pursuing relating to this matter and other potential policy options that may be presented by this matter. And so uh, when they're <coughs> done with their presentation, I am going to ask that we uh, continue this matter to allow them a greater opportunity to, to have that analysis. But, um, but I would like to uh, first, well, why, don't we, why don't we hear first from the police department uh, and then we'll go to the city attorney. Good morning, council members. Good morning, everyone. Captain Bill Hart. I'm the commanding officer of Gang and Narcotics Division. And within Gang and Narcotics Division, we have the gun unit, uh, which handles gun matters of various types throughout the city. And Detective Rick Tompkins, who is the OIC, the officer in charge of that unit, is here with me. Rick can better than I can answer any specific questions you might have. But as far as the motion is concerned, uh, I wanted to express the department's support for the motion. Um, the department is supportive of any effort to reduce gun violence in the city. Yeah. And Chief Beck, as you are, believes, uh, as you do, Chief Beck believes that uh, the city of Los Angeles should be in the forefront of any efforts to reduce gun violence. There are some concerns with the motion uh, or the implementation of an ordinance that would only affect Los Angeles. Obviously, it would be preferable to have a state law. But as uh, former Councilman Fuhrer said, uh, oftentimes if we take the initiative here in the city, the rest of the state and perhaps even other states often follow. So um, for those reasons, we are supportive of the, of the effort. Um, I know that the city attorney can address the legal issues involved, but um, we would be supportive of their efforts to draft an ordinance. Thank you. Um, and before we hear from the city attorney, if I could just ask Sergeant Tompkins, um, in your experience in the gun unit, can you talk a little bit about some of the high capacity magazines that, uh, that our officers encounter on the streets and also the challenges that they have in addressing that problem given the fact that possession in itself is not currently great. Yeah, the biggest thing we have uh, that I think is a good thing is the uh, gun buyback program, which we've done over the last four or five years. Um, we get a tremendous amount of high capacity magazine that, which are automatically just destroyed um, on a daily basis. Um, whether it's handguns, rifles, or assault weapons. Uh, the high cap magazines are always there. We'll find them in the houses, in the cars, um, in the firearms themselves. Uh, 
this is long overdue um, for the state of California and for the city of Los Angeles. So yes, we are in support of it. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good morning. Uh, morning. Bill Carter, City Attorney's Office, Chief Deputy to City Attorney Carmen Tutanich. The uh, City Attorney's Office supports any and all gun control measures that the Council is pursuing. Uh, as I've spoke to uh, City Attorney Trutanich, he supports any measure that would get these high-capacity magazines off the street. As, as most of you know, both myself and City Attorney Trutanich are prosecutors. We've been prosecutors myself over 25 years. We both prosecuted individuals that have used illegal weapons, that have shot individuals, that have harmed victims. So we've been in the courtroom. We've talked to the victims. We've put people in prison. We know what it's like when these weapons are on the street and used illegally. So we support these measures. The other thing I want to add is Los Angeles is the only city in the country now, the only city in the country that is doing something unique. The gun purchaser letter. You may think that's a fairly simple idea, but it's a very important idea. The city attorney's office, every time an individual in the city of Los Angeles purchases a gun, handgun, or long gun, we send a letter to that individual and advise them of their obligations on how to handle that weapon. And the reason we do that and why we're doing that is to tell that individual you must keep track of your weapon, don't transfer it, and don't purchase it for someone who's called a straw purchaser. Because we know what happens when a straw purchaser gets a weapon. Recently we saw in Webster, New York, an individual bought high capacity weapons uh, AR-15 Bushmaster for an individual who was mentally ill and a felon. She bought that weapon, gave it to that individual, and he used it to kill two firemen who responded to a fire that he set after he killed his sister. That's what we're trying to prevent. If we can prevent just one of those, we've done our job. What's alarming, though, the side effect of that is alarming because I think we're the only people in the... I know we're the only people in the state. We may be the only ones in the country. But it is alarming that we are finding over 200 weapons a day are being purchased by Angelinos. That's 200. Put that in perspective. That's over 70,000 guns a year are being purchased by Angelinos. And put that in perspective with the buyback program, which we all thought was a success, and it was. That buyback program brought in 2,500 guns. So we have over 70,000 that are being purchased. We need to do more. We need to do much more to control guns and to control these high capacity magazines. So with that said, we're going to work with the city council. We'll work with you, Councilman Krikorian, and others. Uh, we've, had, we've given this a lot of thought. Obviously, there are issues with pre preemption any time you deal with weapons or any type of law, whether it be marijuana or anything else. But I think we've found a way around any preemption issues, and I know we've talked to you, Councilman Krikorian. There are provisions in the law that are somewhat vague and silent about what possession means, but I think given what we have found in the law, there is a provision that makes it the possession of these high-capacity magazines a nuisance per se, under state law. State law makes it a nuisance for anyone to possess these magazines. So it is possible that the city could draft an ordinance that would adopt any state nuisance which would allow us to regulate the possession of those magazines as a nuisance. So we're prepared to do that. We're prepared to draft that ordinance. Uh, we are uh, willing to uh, work with the council and any other council member. We think we can work around that. Any of these preemption issues that you've heard from others. But I, we do agree that these matters have to these matters have to be started at the, at the local level because as far as I recall my history, a lot of these matters that are now state law started at the local level. And we think this is the time to do it. Uh, the City Attorney Trutanich has worked, reached out to President Obama and Vice President Biden and has provided our information regarding the uh, gun purchaser letter. And by the way, uh, we are working with both Chief Beck and uh, Attorney General Kamala Harris on that program. Both of them have signed on to that. And uh, one clarification, with respect to the long guns, 
Uh, that is another area of the law that hopefully the legislature and others, there's only so much we can do at the local level. We are hoping that the state legislature will solve some of these problems because there are heavy lobbying in Sacramento, because there are certain things that we can and can't do with respect to long guns. There's certain information that can't be maintained or can't be possessed, which is a problem, and we have to be very mindful of that. So I want to clarify that if I misspoke. But that's where Sacramento has to help us solve some of these problems. And in the context of your report back, um, I, for one, would welcome hearing those sorts of issues where there are state laws, areas of state law that um, are, are appropriate for amendment uh, so that we can work with our representatives in Sacramento to ensure that that happens uh, as well. I want to go back to the gun unit, if I may, uh, for one minute. Uh, I just Mr. want to Chair. remind you the time is running. Yeah, just really quickly. Just if can can you describe what the current protocol is now within the city of Los Angeles for um, gun sales and the uh, sharing of information between uh, gun dealers and the department with regard to ammunition purchases? Well, um, I think it goes back to like 1996 when the city council of the city of LA came up with an ordinance to deal with uh, ammunition sales. Um, it's 5511 of the Los Angeles Municipal Code requires a person to leave. Um, he has to provide a driver's license, his uh, personal information, and a thumbprint on an ammo log at the stores uh, as he's purchasing the ammunition. Um, LAPD, specifically the gun unit, will pick up these ammo logs. We run these persons for uh, to see if they're prohibited. If they are prohibited, we go through the DA's office or the CA uh, for a filing. We have done search warrants on them. Currently, we have to pick up those logs uh, manually. We are hoping, uh, possibly in the near future, to have those electronically sent to us from the dealers to the uh, Los Angeles Police Department. So just to reiterate that, members of the Los Angeles Police Department have to physically go around and pick up the ammunition logs and hope that there's sufficient uh, uh, personnel to be able to do all those follow-up uh, uh, checks uh, and and follow up on the red flags that those ammo logs raise. I would like to ask that uh, when we report back on this matter the next time, uh, and I am going to ask members that it be held in committee and continued to, to our next hearing, uh, but I would like to ask the Los Angeles Police Department to report back on um, the uh, possibility of automating that reporting process so that we can have more instantaneous reporting through uh, through the internet or otherwise. Councilman, we're actually already working on that. There's something being prepared for the police commission that addresses that. Uh, there's a program in Sacramento that's the only other city in the state that I'm aware of that actually requires an ammo log uh, besides Los Angeles. And they do have an automated program, and we're working with them to try and uh, determine whether we could implement something like that here. Very good. So if you could bring that back when uh, we bring this, this matter back for discussion uh, to this committee. That would be terrific. Councilman, I hate to be so presumptuous, but if this matter were to move to council now, we'd be prepared to have our report done. Wow. If you want to move it now, we'll be ready to go. Thank you for that commitment. That I appreciate how it. Much, how, much, <laughs> how much time would you need so we can get a schedule? How much time do you want? I mean, how um, much... Yeah. I, I would suggest a week to 10 days at most. We'll get it done. Together. So why don't we say 10 days and let's do We'll so. have it in council. Okay. John, if you can have that scheduled to council within 10 days. <laughs> well, what we'll have in council is... I can't speak for LAPD, but I'll speak for the city attorney's <laughs> Well, no, that, that's good. We can, we can have it. If we can have it in council in 10 days... Well, the motion itself. So if any subsequent report from the city attorney comes in, you can either waive that sure. or hear right. it in committee again. Very good. Very good. But the, the author I would, do I that. would move to do that as uh, Mr. Chairman. That's fine. I, I, I support that. Uh, Okay. Uh, one question I have. Gun stores in Los Angeles, what's the number that we currently have? We have, uh, there's 19 on paper. Um, Nine, those, 19? Yeah, but three of those are actually on their way out. They didn't renew their permits uh, through DOJ or through the uh, city. Uh, so basically 16, sir, for the city. And is that all weapons, all types of weapons? weapons all types of guns, I should say? Weapons and ammo. Uh, and ammo. How about ammo sales? Uh, 16. So that's it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Physical location. Physical yeah. location. And then how many uh, federally licensed dealers are there? Uh, um, no, that's another story. A, a whole lot. Uh, yeah. For the city of Los Angeles and the state of uh, L.A. County, um, a huge number. I so I, I was, we've made the progress in trying to address this issue on the distribution aspect, but the possession is still a factor, obviously. That's correct. 
Okay. Um, and I was contacted by Chief Moore recently regarding the issue of individuals who get the weapon, the check is done, and they don't have the legal authority to have it, whether they're an ex-con or some other type of situation. Are you aware of those situations? Are you talking on the firearm or on the ammunition? The firearm. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is what the, uh, the city attorney was talking about. If, if a person is denied a, well, it comes in part of it. If a person does a firearm registration, where he, he does his paperwork for a firearm, he's denied by Department of Justice. He gets a uh, denial letter. The city's also given a copy of that um, that letter, letting us know that he was denied for whatever reasons uh, for prohibiting or for owning a gun. And some of these folks have guns. Some of the guys do have guns. Uh, the the apps program, uh, the armed and prohibited person uh, system. We're trying to address that right now. I think we're at 2650 for the city of Los Angeles and we're aggressively attacking that number. Okay. Uh, this year, more so than the past couple of years. We right. average see about a 1% to 2% rejection rate. That's what we're seeing Okay. on the applicants. All right. Okay, good. And obviously we want to end the tragedies that, uh, and Joshua, I, I remember that tragic incident. It's nice to see you here and uh, now, shall we say, a young man. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, we have one public speaker on general comment, uh, Arnold Sachs, and uh, we'll, so we'll get this in scale. We'll, we'll, let's approve this unanimous, and we're going to get it to council. Thank you, Mr. Corey, for that. Arnold Sachs. Thank you to all the members of the public who came down. Comment. Thank you very Thank you. much. And Mr. Corey will keep us informed of the progress as it goes to council for the uh, full approval. Public comment. Yes. Thank you. Good morning, Arnold Sachs. I did want to comment. Um, actually, three items. Uh, your request for catastrophic, your funding for catastrophic preparedness. Um, this goes directly to the Dorner situation. The fact that there was a communication, you want a catastrophic preparedness program, which would involve communications between different policing agencies. I'm sure it will be investigated. My concern is you have a Torrance Police Department and you have an LAPD department and no basic preparedness to let the outside agency, you have task force, to let the outside agency know of any kind of traffic that would occur in that neighborhood on a regular basis. That should be looked at. Also, with the recruitment item that you had on your agenda, and this is not an endorsement, but whether she wins or loses, you need to have Wendy Gruel come into this public safety committee meeting and explain how she can make a statement to hire 2,000 police officers for $200 million. She needs to explain that. If she's concerned about the city, it's one of those freak show moments that should be explained. Either it's the truth, if it's close, you got over maybe one and three quarters of that amount of money for the trash fee in increase, and you hired nowhere near 2,000 police. How come? And number three, it was also mentioned about the sales tax. And I would just like to read a quick newspaper article. This is from the LA, the Breeze from um, November 22nd. And it states that this is talking about the half cent sales tax. State law limits how much sales tax can be increased by local governments to a maximum of 2%. I don't know if that's true or not. But with a measure R and the Prop A and the Prop C, that's three half cent sales tax. With this new measure A, that's a fourth half cent sales tax. Metro is looking to put a measure J on to increase sales Thank tax you, again. Thank you, Mr. Sachs. That if is, you uh, do the another sales is now tax, thank you all. Who's going to pay? 